until Monday afternoon. I have returned sooner than I expected. Dr. Charleswell, I hope you are well. Dear Mr. Worthing, I trust this garb of woe does not betoken some terrible calamity. My brother. No shameful deaths and extravagance. Still leading his life of pleasure. Dead. <laughs> Your brother is <laughs> dead. Quite dead. What a lesson for him. I trust he'll profit by it. Mr. Worthing, I offer you my sincere condolence. You have at least the consolation of knowing that you were always the most generous and forgiving of brothers. Poor Ernest. He had many faults, but it was, no doubt, a sad, sad blow. Very sad indeed. Were you with him at the end? Uh, no. He died abroad. In Paris, in fact. I received a telegram from the monitor of the Grand Hotel last night. Was the cause of death mentioned? A severe chill, it seems. As a man sows, so shall he rip. <laughs> charity, dear Miss Prism, charity. None of us are perfect. I myself am peculiarly susceptible to drafts. Will the internment take place here? No, he seems to have expressed a desire to be buried in Paris. In Paris? I fear that hardly points to a very serious state of mind at the last. You would no doubt wish me to make some slight allusion to this tragic domestic affliction next Sunday. My sermon on the meaning of manna in the wilderness can be adapted to almost any occasion, joyful or, as in the present case, distressing. <sighs> <laughs> I have preached it at harvest celebrations, christenings, confirmation, on days of humiliation, and festival days. The last time I delivered it was in the cathedral, as a charity sermon on behalf of the Society for the Prevention of Discontent among the Upper Orders. The bishop, who was present, was much struck by some of the analogies I drew. You mentioned christenings, I believe, Dr. Charleswell. You know how to christen all right, I suppose. I mean, you are continually christening, are you not? It is, I regret to say, one of the rector's most constant duties in the parish. I have often spoken to the poor classes on the subject, but they don't seem to know what the thrift is. But is there a particular infant in whom you are interested, Mr. Worthing? Your brother, I believe, was unmarried, was he not? Yes. People who, li who, people who live entirely for pleasure usually are. <laughs> no, it's not for any child, Dr. Carnival. I'm particularly fond of children. No, the fact is, I would like to be christened myself this afternoon, if you have nothing better to do. But surely, Mr. Worthing, you have been christened already. I don't remember anything about it. But have you any grave doubts on the subject? I certainly know that. Of course, I don't suppose you'd have anything against it. You don't think I'm a little too old now? Not at all. The sprinkling, and indeed the immersion of adults, is a perfectly canonical practice. Immersion? You need have no apprehensions on the subject. Sprinkling is all that is necessary, and indeed, I think advisable. Our weather is so changeable. <laughs> At what hour would you wish the ceremony performed? Oh, I might trot around about five, if that would suit you. Perfectly, perfectly. In fact, I have two similar ceremonies to perform at that time. A case of twins that occurred recently in one of the outlying cottages on your own estate. Poor Mr. Jenkins the Cotter, a most hard-working man. No, I wouldn't see much fun of being christened along with other babies. That would be childish. Would half past five do? Admirably. Admirably. And now, dear Mr. Worthing, I will not intrude any longer into a house of sorrow. I would merely beg you not be too much bowed down with grief. What seem to us bitter trials are often blessings in disguise. This seems to me a blessing of an extremely obvious kind. Uncle <laughs> Jack! Oh, I'm pleased to see you back! But what for clothes you've got on? Do go and change them? Cecily! My child, my child! What is the matter, Uncle Jack? Do look happy! You look as though you had a toothache! And I've got quite a surprise for you! Who do you think is in the dining room? Nonsense. I haven't got a brother. Oh, don't say that. Mm. However badly he may have behaved you in the past, he is still your brother. You couldn't be so heartless as to disown him. I will tell him to come out, and you'll shake hands with him, won't you, Uncle Jack? These are very joyful tidings. After we had all been resigned to his loss, his sudden return seems to be peculiarly distressing. <laughs> <laughs>
He's been telling you about Bunbury, has he? Yes, he's told me all about poor Mr. Bunbury and his terrible state of health. Well, I won't have him talking to you about Bunbury, or about anything else for that matter. It is enough to drive a person perfectly frantic. I admit the faults were on my side, but I think Brother John's coldness to me was particularly painful, especially considering this being the first time I have been at his house. <laughs> Uncle Jack, if you don't shake hands with Ernest, I will never forgive you. Never forgive me? Never, never, never. Well, fine. This is the last time I shall ever do it. It's pleasant, is it not, to see so perfect a reconciliation? <laughs> <laughs> I think we might leave these two brothers together. Cecily, you'll come with us. Certainly, my, Miss Pism. My little task of reconciliation is over. You have done a beautiful action today, dear child. I feel very happy. We must not be premature in our judgment. <laughs> Algy, you young scoundrel, you must leave this place at once. I do not allow any Bunbury in here. I have put Mr. Ernest's things in the room next to your own. I suppose that is all right? What? Mr. Ernest's Ernest luggage. I put it in the room next to your own. His luggage? Yes. Three portmanteaus, a dressing case, two hat boxes, and a large luncheon basket. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I can only stay a week this time. <laughs> Merriman, order the dog cart at once. Mr. Ernest has been suddenly called back to town. Yes, sir. What a fearful lie you are, Jack. I have not been called back to town at all. Yes, you have. Well, I haven't heard anyone calling. Your duty as a gentleman calls you back. My duty as a gentleman has never interfered with my pleasures in the smallest degree. Well, I can quite understand that. Well, Cecily is a darling. You are not to talk about Miss Carter like that. I don't like it. <laughs> well, I don't like your clothes. You look perfectly ridiculous in them. Why on earth don't you go up and change? It is perfectly childish for you to be in deep mourning for a man who is actually staying with you at your house for a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> you are certainly not staying with me as a whole week, for as a guest or as anything else. You have got to go! By the 4 train. I certainly will not leave. So long as you are in mourning, I would think that most unkind. Well, we go if I change my clothes. Certainly, but... I never saw a man take so long to dress with such little result. In any case, that's better than being always overdressed as you are. If I am immensely overdressed, I make up for it by being immensely overeducated. <laughs> your vanity is ridiculous. Your conduct in outrage and your presence in my garden utterly absurd. However, you've got to catch the 4-5 train, and I hope that you have a pleasant journey back to town. This Bunbury, as you call it, has not been a great success for you. It has been a great success. I am in love with Cecily, and that is everything. But I must see her before I go, and make arrangements for another bundle. <laughs> ah, mm, there she is. Oh, I nearly came back to wash the roses. You were with Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack's ordered the dog cart for me. Oh, is he going to take you for a nice drive? No, he's, he's going to send me away. Then, have we got to part? Yes, and I'm afraid it's the most painful parting. It's always painful to part from people whom one has known for a very brief space of time. The absence of old friends one can endure with equanimity, with even a momentary separation from anyone to whom one has just been introduced is almost unbearable. <laughs> the dog cart is at the door, sir. It can wait for a minute, for five minutes. Yes, miss. Cecily, I hope you'll not take offense if I state quite openly and frankly that you seem to me in every way to be the visible personification of absolute perfection. I think your frankness is your credit, Venice. Yeah. If you allow me, I will copy your remarks into my diary. You keep a diary? Well, I would much like to see it, may I? Oh, no. You see, it is simply a very young girl's record of her own thoughts and impressions, and consequently, meant for publication. <laughs> when it appears in volume form, I hope you'll order a copy. But pray, Ernest, don't stop. I delight in taking down from dictation. I have reached absolute perfection.
You can go on, I'm quite ready for more. Ahem, <laughs> <coughs> Cecily. Oh, don't cough, Ernest. And when is dictating, what to speak fluently, and not cough. Besides, I don't know how this fellow cough. <laughs> Cecily, ever since I looked into your eyes, I have dared to love you wildly, passionately, devotedly, and hopelessly. I don't think you should tell me that you love me wildly, passionately, devotedly, hopelessly. Hopelessly doesn't seem to make much sense, does it? Cecily. The dog cart is here, sir. Tell her to come around next week at the same hour. Yes, sir. Uncle Jack would be very much annoyed if he knew you were staying on till next week at the same hour. I don't care about Jack. I don't care about anyone in the whole world but you. I love you, Cecily. You will marry me. You silly boy! Of course! <laughs> Why, we've been engaged for the last three months. The last three months? <laughs> yes, it'll be exactly three months on Thursday. But how did we become engaged? Well, ever since Uncle Jack first confessed to us that he had a younger brother, who was very wicked and bad, you of course had formed the chief topic of conversation between myself and Miss Prism, a man who is much talked about as always very attractive. But we <coughs> must be something in him after all. I dare say it was foolish on the earnest, but I fell in love with you. But when did we become engaged? On the 14th of February last, worn out by your entire ignorance of my existence. <laughs> I'm at respect, Ernest. I'm at 
might admire your character, but I fear that I should not be able to give you my undivided attention. Well, your chasuble here, he is experienced in all the rites and practices of all the churches, yes? Oh, yes. Dr. Chasuble's the most learned man. He has never written a single book, so you can imagine how much he knows. <laughs> right, well, I must see him on the most important christening. I, I mean, the most important business. Considering that we have been engaged since February the 14th, and that I only met you today for the first time, I feel it's rather hard that you should leave me for so long a period as half an hour. Couldn't you make it 20 minutes? I shan't be away too long. <laughs> 